we are finally getting back to the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> to a series that we began many months ago, and it's a series on making disciples, where we want to become more like the followers of Jesus Christ. Flip the slide, please. As a part of that, God's in challenge, well, went too far. There should have been a whole bunch of slides before that. Okay, let me regroup. <laughs> I'm sorry? Well, it was before that. So it, there was Mark, it was Mark chapter 7. It's, we're now into Mark 8. Yeah, but no, it's not a verse. It, there were several items on there. If, so what I was hoping to do was review for you what the last message in Mark 7 was about. Now, does anybody remember back in September what that last message was about? Good. So whatever I say will be correct then, right? <laughs> if you were to look at Matthew 7, the end, uh, you would see that one of the things that Jesus was trying to teach his disciple is that the nations matter. He was actually ministering to Gentiles. And when, when Jesus later at the end of his ministry will tell us to go out into all the world, he really meant the whole world. And that that world, in fact, Acts, Acts chapter 1 says that the Holy Spirit will come upon the disciples, and this is the same responsibility for us, and anoint them and empower them to be witnesses in Jerusalem, that's where they lived, Judea, Samaria, that's where those half-breeds lived, and to the uttermost parts of the world, that's where the nations are that we don't like. <laughs> that's what he was saying to the Jews. Said, You're going to be anointed to go out to the, the closest places to you, in other words, to your home, to your neighbors, to your family, to your oikos, as we refer to that in this church, to that household of people that are connected to you, the people you spend time with, co-workers, co-laborers, um, neighbors, friends, family, do, do, are, by the way, is anyone here a recluse and doesn't talk to anybody except for on Sunday morning? Okay, well, you recluses. Relu you recluses need to apologize for lying. No. <laughs> you, you recluses need to get out of there <laughs> because God has you alive for one purpose. If you don't know him, it's to know him. And if you know him, it's to tell others so that they can get to know him. And that's, the why, that's why we're here. If you're still breathing, if your heart's still beating, if your brain's still functioning, God's called you to be a missionary to the world. And that world begins inside your home and then spreads out from there. And so the, the last lesson in Mark chapter 7 was, man, you got to be concerned about the nations, Got to be concerned about taking Jesus to all people. And when he was saying the nations, he was saying even to the people you don't like. And for some of you, that may include even taking Jesus to your enemies. Now, some of you are so sweet and nice, you don't have any enemies. <laughs> So that was kind of the wrap up of chapter 7. And now we go into chapter 8. And in, math, in Mark chapter 8, we're going to get into what's referred to as the feeding of the 4,000. How many of you know that he fed people twice, 4,000 and 5,000? The interesting thing about that is, is that there's a lot of exposure given to the feeding of the 5,000. Almost no exposure given to the feeding of the 4,000. Have you under, ever wondered why? Well, wonder why right now. <laughs> Why is it that there's so much focus and, and we all know about the feeding of the 5,000, but why don't we talk about the feeding of the 4,000? It's, it's, what's that? It's not in all four Gospels. Oh, so we know all four Gospels so well that we know it's not in all four. It's only in two of them, and because of that, it's not as important. Go ahead and blush. <laughs> There's some other reasons why. 
Let's read uh, Math Mark. I'm going to keep saying Matthew. So if I say Matthew, just know I mean Mark. All right? We got that one square? Okay. Mark, 8th chapter, verse 1. During those days, another large crowd <clears throat> gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Did I tell you that Jesus fed 5,000 people just about six months before this? Did, did, did I happen to mention that when he fed those 5,000 people, he had the disciples break the bread and the fish and share it with, with them? And, and did you happen to also remember that, that they took a little boy's lunch and divided that? Well, just in case, I just thought it'd be helpful for us to remember that as we're going through this. Obviously, the disciples forgot. How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they did so. That They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present, and having sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? And now he's going to help them. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces then did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? We're going to try to walk through just a few of the, whoops. Just a few of the, the comparisons between these two feedings, the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000. And I should warn you that one of the reasons why we hear about the feeding of the 5,000 and we don't hear so much about the feeding of the 4,000 is because the 5,000 were Jews and you watch and you see who the 4,000 were. I think that you may agree at the end of this that the 4,000 were Gentiles. Ah, there may be a reason why we don't talk as much about them. <coughs> the hour is already late. It's a Jewish phrase that refers to the time of the temple evening offering and to the time of saying the evening Shema. Hear, O Israel, thou art God, thou art one God. Um, um, which was said evening and morning. That's what happened with the feeding of the 5,000. They're at the time of the Shema blessing. Well, then they've got to do something about that. That's the feeding of the 5,000. That would say they were Jews. 
in the feeding of the 4,000, it says that these people glorified the God of who? Israel. So these people are looking on the outside, acknowledging that there's a God of Israel that's to be honored. And so their blessing, and therefore, well, that would give us evidence that these people are what? Outsiders. Goyim. Gentiles. In the feeding of the 5,000, they talk about going into the villages and buying uh, food. And that, how are we going to go into all the villages and buy enough food for all these people? We don't have that much money. The evidence that they were in what? Jewish land, which incidentally, they were. They were on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. Talk to Leslie, who's celebrating the fact that she's here on this morning, even though she had surgery on Thursday. So you, you just you know, talk to her and say, so where was the Galilean side? And where was the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee? East and west. They're on the, the, Gen, the Jews are on the west side. Uh, it says that there were fourth in the feeding of the 4,000. They, they, he said, I can't, I can't. Ah, oh, yeah, there's the picture. So you did find some of the other slides. Oh, just playing tricks on me. Last week he said the sound didn't work and it worked. This week the slides aren't there and they're there. Okay, I don't know about you, Daryl. April Fool's was on Friday, so okay, no more. <laughs> well, if you can see it up there, you can see the Sea of Galilee, Gennesaret, Mag Magadan actually um, is uh, where Mary of who? Magdalene. Stick note. That's the western side. Eastern side is the side of the Gentiles. Well, they can't, they can't release them because if they, he did, on their way home, they would faint. The western side is almost uninhabited. It's amazing that they gathered this 4,000 people. And by the way, that's 4,000 men. We don't know how many children and women. Probably more than double that. So there was at least 8,000, probably more like 10 or 12,000 that were out there, something like that in the total number. So then in the feeding of the 5,000, Notice, Jesus says, well, how, how many loaves of bread were there? There were five loaves of bread. And, and incidentally, numbers matter in Scripture. <clears throat> the five loaves, that would have been for them a reminder of the five books of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the use of 12 baskets, well, where have we heard of 12 before? 12 disciples, but that's not why there. Twelve sons of Jacob, twelve tribes of Israel who are supposed to occupy the promised land. Twelve matters to God, doesn't it? And incidentally, the, the baskets, um, I think I'm going to come to this later, so I'll try to hold back. The, but this refers to twelve tribes of Israel. So that would be evidence that the 5,000 are Come on, get into this with me. Jews. Okay, say it. Jews. Thank you. Okay, the 4,000. The seven loaves of bread refers to spiritual completion. It's a, it's a number for perfection. When both Jews and Gentiles will be led to the bread of life. And the use of the 4,000 refers to the, to the world. Four would be north, south, east, and west. Notice these numbers coming together. And the use of the numbers of seven and four are evidence that the 4,000 were Gentiles. Gentiles. Say it with me. Gentiles, Gentiles okay? The 5,000, there's two small fish. John 6, 9 uses the Greek word opserion. It's about salty, little salted fish, kind of almost like sardines that are, that are where are they packaged? They're packaged at Magdala on the eastern shore, excuse me, on, on the western shore. Like most ports, there was a high incidence of immorality, which may fill the background for the incident that, of the casting out of the seven demons from whom? Mary Magdalene. That would give us evidence that the 5,000 were? I didn't teach you yet. I've, I've got to work on this. The five, five are Jews. So, so this evidence of the, the, the small fish on that side would be evidence that these people were? Gentiles. The five were Jews. <laughs> so on the western side, this would give us evidence that these people were? Jews. Jews. <laughs> the 4,000 had <laughs> 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 
the 4,000, they were on the ground. They were out there in the desert area, and, and there's no grass where the 5,000 are. In fact, Leslie, I will also tell you that the, the eastern, the, the, I'm going to keep saying that wrong too, the western side is really green and grassy and colorful and beautiful. The eastern side, oh, Oh, oh man, it's just like rocks and almost nothing else. That's where the man from Gerasenes had all those demons in him, cast them out and all. And they're sitting over on the ground over there, but they're on the grass over here. So the, the 5,000, that would be the people who are Jews. Jews, and the 4,000 would be the people who are Gentiles. Gentiles. You're getting there. 5,000, it says that he blessed the bread, broke it, and gave out the fish. Why is that significant? Because in Israel, the Jewish way, you was blessed all the meal at once. Ah, but if you're a Gentile, what would you do? You would bless the parts of the meal. And so they, in, in, with the Gentiles, what did he do? He took the bread and he blessed that and served that. And then he blessed the fish and served that. And that would tell us that the 5,000 are what? Jews. And the 4,000 are what? Yeah. We're getting there. Okay. He says he took baskets. In fact, there were, there were what? 12 basketfuls of bread and food left over from the feeding of the 5,000. But the interesting thing there is that we probably should translate that. There were 12 backpacks. Okay. And it's a day pack, actually. It's a day pack that holds enough uh, food and whatever else you're going to carry with you for a day. Like the little boy carrying his two little fish and his five loaves of bread and all. He was carrying his lunch that mom prepared at McDonald's that morning or for him. And so he was eating that. Sorry for throwing that one in. It distracted you. Okay. So the 5,000, it says, that, that they were, had these kofinas, a shoulder basket, that Jews used. Not Gentiles. Therefore, the 5,000, based on the 12 backpacks left over, were? Jews. Jews. Oh, some of you lost the enthusiasm. <laughs> but with the other side of the lake, it says that they took, and they had seven basketfuls. But they're not backpacks. They're large baskets. It's the same kind of basket that Paul was lowered down over the wall when he was about to be killed in a Gentile city, Mark. Just take note. And it's the size that could hold and support a man. So these are seven giant basketfuls of bread that are left over. And that would tell us that these are probably, the 4,000 are? Five thousand were what? Jews. You, you, you realize that pastor's going to keep doing this till you all get into it, okay? The five thousand were what? Jews. The four thousand were what? Gentiles. And just the disciples missed it at times, didn't they? And the nation of Israel missed it. That God had concern for all people. And that Jesus the Messiah came for the nations, not just for Israel. And something very dangerous will happen in a few moments. Did you see it in the first part of our text? When we're looking at the red letters, which means Jesus is talking. And looking out over the people, he says to his disciples, I have compassion for these people. Jesus, next slide. Jesus is moved with compassion. Yeah, so I think now we're in the, still in the slides that I was looking for earlier. So. Back up. Back one. <laughs> it's shut down. <laughs> there it is. <clears throat> They've been out there for three days. Think about that. Uh, most of you are already getting hungry, wondering how soon this is going to get over. <laughs> they were out there for three days. 
They long ran out of their food. Some people say that the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 was, well, really, it wasn't God really didn't divide all this up and create all this stuff from nothing. Instead, some people say that what God did was it was a miracle of unselfishness. He broke through the fact that all these people had food along with them. They had their five bread loaves and two fish. And finally, with the sharing from that little boy, everyone else got out their food. And the net result was there was a whole bunch more food than anyone thought. Okay, cool. Let's say that's what happened. That would be a miracle, incidentally, to get all these selfish people to share. Okay. <laughs> and to have a whole bunch left over in the process. That would be a miracle. Here's the problem with that one for the feeding of the 4,000. You ate all the food on Friday. It's now Sunday. <laughs> okay. So even if you tried to squander it for a while, you surely ate it all on Saturday. It's now near the end of the day on Sunday. You've been out here for three days and your food didn't last that long. And Jesus says, I have compassion for these people. He said, look, my heart, my emotions are deeply moved for these people. I'm concerned about them. He uses this word splanktha, and it's a, the moving of the emotions where you get ch churned up inside. Jesus is churning up inside because he's really breaking and he's concerned. It's the same, same feeling he had and will have in a few weeks when he's looking out over Jerusalem. He's getting ready to walk down the mountain. Uh, across the side is the holy temple, and over there is the hill called Golgotha, which is where he's about to die in seven days. And on Palm Sunday, he comes down that hillside and he looks out over Jerusalem and he cries because he's longed to draw this nation that he's blessed to his, under his arms and to protect and bless them and they're rejecting him. And in a few days, they will, dis they will actually crucify him. Because I feel compassion. I want you to think back over scripture. Second Chronicles 36, 14, and 15 says to, that in the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they're, they're prophesying to Judah and to Israel that's under tyranny of wicked kings. And it says that he had compassion. God had compassion on his people. Psalm 78, they, they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. But they deceived him with their mouth. They lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast toward him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But but he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity. <laughs> Psalm 111, 4. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Jesus looks at these people, these Gentiles, these people that the nation of Israel dislikes. And he says, I have compassion for them. Incidentally, this is the only place in scripture where Jesus says this. There are a lot of times where the, the authors to the scripture will say, and Jesus had compassion. Jesus felt compassion, just like as he was coming down in Jerusalem. He had compassion for the woman who had had that bleeding issue all her life. He uh, had compassion for Mary and Martha. He had compassion for the, the leper. But here, Jesus says it in his own words. I have compassion for these people. Oh, that we would have that same compassion. There's an interesting little thing that happens. Jesus asked the disciples, how much bread do you have? Seven loaves. Good. And he takes it. You see, Jesus takes what the disciples have. Jesus takes what we have. Sometimes we think, you know, I don't have that much. Okay, but could two of you come up with $15 a month to host a child? I don't have that much either. Okay, well, could you come up with a cup of coffee that you don't buy? And could four of you at just seven fifty a month host a child? Because what Jesus wants to do, he doesn't say you have to be wealthy, but he says, I'll take what you have and I'll use it for my purposes. That's what he does. Barclay says it this way, don't try to push the responsibility for helping onto someone else. Don't say that you would help if you only had something to give. Don't say that in these circumstances to help is impossible. Take what you have and give it to God and see what happens. 
Jesus takes what the disciples, he will take what we have and he'll use it for his purposes. But here's something that is, I said earlier was dangerous. Jesus sighed deeply. <laughs> you ever heard a mom or dad do that? <sighs> Jesus sighed deeply. <sighs> when I do that, Debbie says, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> Tools aren't working. Computer just froze again. Don't ask. <laughs> Jesus sighed deeply. And he said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to you. He was on the western side and he fed 5,000. He's taken six months or so and he's traveled around to the eastern side. And during that time, we have literally nothing else in Scripture about this time except that Jesus was teaching his disciples, having an intimate time with them. There are a few moments where there's some healings of Gentiles that took place. He heads up towards uh, some of the most, wow, most um, unholy places where all kinds of Roman gods were worshipped and temples were given. And the Mount of Transfiguration, incidentally, is right at, uh, up a mountain from where they had worshipped all these gods and all. And he travels on around. He gets over to the western side and he's continuing to teach his disciples. And over here, he starts teaching now the crowd again. And 4,000 men, at least, Gentiles, come and he feeds them out there. And now he gets in a boat and he goes back across the lake, over to Magdala, over to the city of Mary Magdalene. And as he gets out of the boat there guess who's waiting for him it's the greeting party that had sent him off some six or seven months earlier that were upset with him before that wanted him to prove that he was the Messiah and they see it's Jesus that's coming this man that's performed miracle after miracle cast out demons done incredible things in front of their eyes and they see him coming and they go there to the shore and they say we want a sign that you prove to us that you're the Messiah I fed 5,000 people I fed 4,000 people I've healed the sick. I've cast out demons. The lame are walking. The blind are seeing. The deaf are coming back to life. The dumb are, are speaking. What more do you want? Well, we want to hear a voice from heaven. If you were there at my baptism, the Father spoke. What more? And Jesus exasperated and says, I will not show another sign to this generation. This generation that has seen so much. This generation that has had so much evidence of the presence and the power of God. And oh my goodness, and I started saying, oh my, which generation is Jesus speaking to today? Is he just speaking to the generation of the Jews that were there on the side of the Sea of Galilee? Or is he speaking to a generation of Americans who've, who've reached a point, they've seen God work, they've watched his miracles, they've experienced his power and yet do we want to know more do we want more evidence that God is real and that he's called us to go out there to the nations oh that we would not be the generation that he says I won't show a sign to this generation and he gets, watch out, he gets back in the boat and he heads back out across the sea. Brothers, watch out for the yeast of the, le the, the leaven of the Pharisees. The yeast. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. What, 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 what's, he, what's, he, what's, he, what's he mean? How did he know we only have one loaf of bread with us? Is that what he's talking about? We don't have enough bread with us? Oh, you guys, don't you get it yet? What, what do I have to do? Didn't I feed 5,000? He goes through the whole thing again, right? He, he, he gets out his Excel spreadsheet and he talks about all the details of what happened, the size of the baskets and all that. I fed the 5,000. I fed the 4,000. Haven't I shown you yet that if you're with me, I've got the resources of heaven at my disposal to meet your needs? and to help you to reach out into this world. Don't you get it? Amen. 
What have you seen Jesus do? And maybe you need to think about the things that you've given credit to someone else. A doctor performed a miraculous healing. You know, we have children living today with hearts that are broken and backwards and half in there and, and, and it's a miracle that they're alive. What have we given credit to man when it was God's hand? What has Jesus done for you lately? I'm in the, I <laughs> wish I had a picture of it. I'm standing inside my front, that my Jeep, between where the radiator was and where the fan blade were. So somebody driving up the road sees two lakes sticking out of the bottom of my car. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm working on the water pump and I'm down inside there and my 15 millimeter metric socket, which the neighbor brought over the day before because it wasn't working and I was exasperated and on. I didn't have the right, right tool. I'm down in there and it's not long enough. <laughs> and then I finally get everything off and I get the water pump. How am I gonna get the water pump back in there behind that other metal thing? And suddenly, guy dries up. Hey, Bill, what you doing? <laughs> Working on my water pump, don't bother me. <laughs> got everything you need? No. <laughs> need a long 15 mil I got one back at the house. So Steve runs up the street, gets his 15 millimeter long, comes back, socket comes back down, and he's watching, kind of helping me see some things and on. You know, uh, since I realized I didn't have a long 15 mil, I was also, I also knew that I didn't have the gasket um, goop, so I was gonna go buy them both. I've got gasket goop, he goes back up, gets the gasket goop, brings it back down. We get ready to put the, that water pump back in there. I stick it in, I'm like, oh Jesus, please help, because I don't want any more frustration. And that thing just slipped right in. <laughs> And I'm still thanking Jesus to this day. <laughs> there are some frustrating moments, and cars are one of those, and working on them when you don't know what you're doing and don't have the right tools and all that other kind of stuff. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that I didn't get all ticked off as well, because <laughs> I know that would have hurt even more. Thank you, Jesus. And this morning I woke up still having that sense of, Thank you, Jesus for what you're doing. But yesterday there was a memorial service right here. And I'm gonna go ahead and confess something to you. The slide presentation ended. At the end of the slide presentation, the man, they, they decided to put a picture up there of this gentleman. And he gave the one-fingered salute at the end of the slide presentation. <laughs> and I walked up and I said, I told you there would be some surprises today. <laughs> but I said that God accepts us all. And it was a, one of those moments to be able to talk to this family who had just lost their father and be able to talk to them. And, and most, uh, in fact, almost all the people that were here yesterday have no church home, are not believers and followers of Jesus Christ. And yet I got to talk to them about, I am the resurrection, the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. For he who believes in me will never die. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. And Jesus asked Mary and Martha when he said, I'm the resurrection, and he said, do you believe this? And it's back to us again. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? We're here with a purpose. It's to change our world. We don't need more signs to prove that God exists or that God has met us and God has provided miracles around us. We need to start acting like we really believe it. Do you get it? Jesus is coming back, folks. You and I both don't know when, but he's coming back. For somebody, he's coming back today like he did for Gail's wife, Sa Sally, yes, last Sunday on Easter Sunday. Sandy, excuse me. God is coming for people. Do you get it? You have a responsibility. Communion is not just about you coming and saying, wow, I'm, thank you, I'm saved, Jesus. Thank you, I'm not going to hell. Thank you, heaven's been prepared for me in a mansion that's getting ready for me. Thank you, God, that you love me and you care about me. No, communion is a reminder that God is saying, 
take it to the world. Use what you've got. If you only have one loaf of bread between a group of 12 of you, then use that loaf of bread to feed the world. Because God has given us enough and God will multiply what we have for his glory.